Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to the Word on the Streets 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual festival. I'm David Alexander, the Festival Director for the Word on the Street Toronto, and I'm excited to introduce tonight's feature conversation on Return of the Trickster, a conversation between author Eden Robinson and interviewer Lisa Bird Wilson. Our accessibility sponsor for tonight's event is Penguin Random House Canada. Before we dive into tonight's discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. The Word on the Street also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca Nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the, dish, is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Takaranto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. Just a few announcements before we introduce tonight's speaker. Don't forget to sign up for our upcoming events. This is day nine of our 10 day festival celebrating storytell storytelling, ideas and imagination. Earlier today, we streamed several events, including Looking Inwards, Memoir, Art and Identity, Fabulous, Fabulous Fiction, Exploring Identity Through Myth and Magic, and How to Be Human, Illustrated Wisdom for Modern Times. All of this year's author panels and featured conversations can be found on the Word on the Streets YouTube channel, so you can catch up on anything you might have missed. For information about our upcoming events, please visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. And if you want to be the first to know about new videos from the Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you enjoy tonight's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. And now I'm pleased to introduce the moderator for this panel, Lisa Bird Wilson. Lisa Bird Wilson is a Saskatchewan Métis and Nehiya writer. Her fiction book, Just Pretending, won four Saskatchewan Book Awards, including 2014 Book of the Year, was shortlisted for the Danuta Gleed Award and was the 2019 One Book, One Province selection. Her debut poetry collection, The Red Files, published by Nightwood Editions in 2016, is inspired by family and archival sources and reflects on the legacy of the residential school system and the fragmentation of families and histories. She is the current prose editor for Grain Magazine, as well as a founding member and chair of the Saskatchewan Aboriginal Writers Circle, Inc. Her new novel, Probably Ruby, was published in Canada by Doubleday in August, and it will be published in the US by Hogarth Random House in spring 2022. Hey, Lisa. Can't say hello. And now I'll introduce our featured guest for this evening, Eden Robinson. Eden Robinson is a Hazla Hailsuck author who grew up in Hazla, British Columbia. Her first book, Trap Lines, a collection of short stories, won the Winifred Holtby Memorial Prize and was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year in 1998. Monkey Beach, her first novel, was shortlisted for both the Giller Prize and the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction in, 20, in 2000 and won the BC Book Prize's Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize. Her novel, Son of a Trickster, was shortlisted for the Giller Prize and has been adapted into a CBC television limited series, Trickster. Trickster Drift, its sequel, won the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize and the final book in the Trickster series, Return of the Trickster, was published in 2021. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Yes. Marcy. All right, we're so excited to, to let you uh, get into the conversation. So I'll turn it over to Lisa now. Excellent, thank you. Tansi Eden. Oh, thank you, for, thank you for hosting me and <laughs> congratulations on probably Ruby. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm so excited to talk about Return of the Trickster with you. I have 100,000 questions. So they're not even going to fit. So we're just going to have to, you know, do our best. First, I want to say how wonderful this book is. I 
you know, part of me couldn't read it fast enough because I wanted to see what was, you know, going to unfold and what was going to happen. But I also kept trying to slow myself down because I wanted it to last. And it's so, it's so readable and it happens like so fast and so much is happening. This book is like intense, man. Like it is really good. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I got like 30 pages from the end and I thought, how is this possibly going to resolve in 30 <laughs> And yet it did. So, you know, what a, what a talent you are. That was just wonderful. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I wonder if we can start. I just want to make those comments first. And then wow. would you do a little bit of a reading? And I'd love to of hear course. you read. Of course. I always open uh, with the beginning. <laughs> Uh, the 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 organ roundup scene. <laughs> uh, the IV drip cold into Jared Martin's arm, a remarkably grounding sensation. Failing, he remembered the nurse telling him he was dehydrated and that he kept throwing up the water they gave him. Bile scorched the back of his throat. An unseen ambulance warbled growing louder. The lights were achingly bright. The hospital mattress was firm against his back and the pale curtains surrounding his bed were shut. Through these fabric walls, he could hear other patients in Kitimat General Hospital Emergency Ward murmuring with their families, friends, and lovers. A scream cut through the quiet as electric doors swooshed open somewhere near, bringing the smell of rain then closed. Voices shouted information and instructions at each other as a lone male voice howled, guttural. He shivered. Nausea hit again. Jared's stomach cramped. The nurse had given him a little cardboard container for his vomit, but it was full and pungent, reeking on the medical table. Jared slid off the bed. The floor was cold against his bare feet. He yanked off the clear tape that held the IV in place and carefully pulled out the needle. The other bed curtains were shut, but through the gaps he could see patients listening intently as another male voice joined the first. He made it out to the corridor where he watched two men fight free of the paramedics and a lone police officer to grapple with each other. A security guard ran past Jared as the men threw punches that landed with earnest thuds. Jared covered his mouth as he started to heave. He pushed open the heavy bathroom door and threw up into the toilet. Blood, bright red against the white enamel, diffused in tendrils in the water, copper in his mouth. The muscles in his throat clenched and released until he threw up again. This time, a stew of blood and chunks. His stomach burned, a hot pain like accidentally swallowing a lot of coal. The searing intensified until it was as if he'd swallowed the whole barbecue pit. Oh God, Jared thought, I'm dying. Wonderful, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I had um, I had someone come up to me after reading, and they had flagged every single page where Jared vomited. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there were a lot of post-it notes in there. <laughs> so I think if you did that through the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's great, though. Um, I want to ask you about Jared. So I just want to say, you know, I think that you've created one of the most endearing characters in fiction that, you know, I've seen in a long, long time. Jared's sweet. He's um, sassy. He's really unexpected. He's sensitive, but he's not a pushover. He annoys people with his irreverent comments and <laughs> smart ass attitude, right? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, creating Jared? Where did this character come from for you? Was there a moment mm. where, you know, you as an author really clicked with Jared? And then I'm also really curious if for you, if Jared is still with you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I started off. Uh, my the first narrator for the series was Weekend, 
And uh, very quickly, I realized that that was not a voice that I could stay with for uh, more than 20 pages. <laughs> <laughs> he's um he, he's kind of like Sherlock Holmes narrating Sherlock Holmes it would be uh you know you needed a Watson so I originally thought Maggie was going to narrate uh I have you know I have a lot of um stories that I've I, that have stalled and one of those was like a collection of short stories that I was trying to write about um an urban traditional dance group in East Vancouver. And the short stories were going to be interconnected and they were going to, the first half was going to be like how they came together. And the second half would be like how they fell apart. So it was going to be my, you know, uh, the commitments that in East Vancouver <laughs> was a traditional dance group. <laughs> Uh, cause, you know, uh, I just love the dynamics of like each, each of the dance groups that I've been in. Like, I, I would love to capture that in fiction someday. Um, but there was, there was one stalled short story that never went anywhere where there was a young man coming down from Northern BC on a Greyhound bus and it was arriving at midnight, um, in the, the downtown bus stop. And it was such a lonely, haunting scene. And um, so while I was trying to search for a narrator for the, for the trickster short story that I was writing, um, I remembered that scene and I pulled it out of that universe and put it into the trickster universe. And the narrator became Jared. And uh, I actually started the series with Jared arriving in Vancouver. And uh, so his evolution was very surprising. Like I, ha I had a very fixed idea of what a baby trickster would be like. Um, and as, as I got to know Jared, uh, you know, he, he had a huge heart and it got him into trouble more than his sassiness. Uh, and that, that is just a characteristic that is common in family, uh, you know, on my mom's side, on my dad's side, uh, you know, like my grand was quite famous for, uh, we call it loving people who don't know how to love themselves yet. So she, uh, you know, unofficially adopted a lot of people that other people were scared of. And I thought that would be, you know, I, you know, I, my dad, you know, he loved cooking, he loved, um, uh, he loved being cheeky. And, you know, when I was considering like, you know, what would a new trickster be like? Uh, I thought that, you know, <laughs> Jared, like the, the character that Jared evolved would evolved into would be the most annoying person for we get. <laughs> and we get would be the most annoying person for Jared. So there's there's something about that dynamic that I really enjoy because, you know, it, it's present throughout the series. That's uh, I like the way characters bounce off each other. And they can both be right, they can both be wrong, they can both have like radically different points of view just because of what they know or don't know. Um, but I love that interaction. I love that uh, that kind of banter that just is, that is my jam. <laughs> it, and it's wonderful. It's so well done. The, the dialogue, there was not one time in the entire series where I was pulled out by, uh, you know, out, out of the reading, out of the world that you created uh, by anything that happened, you know, in the writing or in the dialogue or anything. I was just, you know, in it the whole time. Uh, so, you know, just wonderful, really, really, uh, really terrific um, to experience uh, those three books. Speaking of three books, uh, now this is, <laughs> This is a trilogy. I can't even imagine <laughs> writing a trilogy. 
So tell me how that came to be. I'm guessing you didn't set out to write a trilogy, <laughs> but I don't know. So where, where did that come from? I uh, well because I started with your like the the initial draft, like the the really messy first draft that I always write. Uh, because I started in Vancouver, I wanted to give the readers a sense of what Gerald's uh, of what Jared's like home life had been like just just to show you know like like what he was doing in Vancouver why he was there why he was going there without much support <laughs> so I had like him and Maggie in like a walk-on scene and uh like you know it was supposed to be like she was supposed to be there for uh you know maybe maybe two or three scenes at the most but again I really liked the dynamic they had it was it was surprisingly tender like they had, they had a lot of um, baggage between them. They had a lot of, uh, you know, they had a lot of stress and strain in their relationship. But underneath everything was was that ride or die. Um, even if they, you know, killed each other in the end, <laughs> the the feelings that they had together were quite gentle, which was very surprising. So she disappeared in the in you know eventually she that like she was an offstage presence in book two, and then she came roaring back in book three, uh, and you know uh, their relationship really changed when Jared changed like not like when he literally became a trickster, but when he stopped viewing her as his solely as his mother, and began viewing her as a as a person. And in that way, I think like it's three books for a, a, a very large canvas for a coming of age story. Uh, but at the time, I thought it was I was just bringing the trickster, the stories that I grew up with. Like uh, my dad was a storyteller and so were his siblings. So, you know, when I was growing up, like after dinner, if we were at someone's house, all the Grown-ups would stay at the table and they they smoke <laughs> and drink coffee and the stories would just roll like when you've got a lot of traditional storyteller trying to outdo each other, uh, it's so much fun and it, it, it they would try to outdo each other and my favorite was like um, dad really loved the Sasquatches like he loved all the Sasquatch stories, uh, but I loved the trickster story is the most because we get was you know he was always wild you never knew where the stories were gonna go and like anything could come alive with all of a sudden like you know we had one story uh where a tree stump <laughs> <laughs> moved on top of a fire pit <laughs> and it was just those those you know thoughts um like i wanted to give the stories that I grew up with, like a, a, a modern context. And uh, so it was a lot of fun to bring in characters that uh, were not as well known. Like uh, we get Sister Jossums, um was more of a Kardashian figure. Uh, she <laughs> Um, I think one of her names is like suspiciously married many times, um, and uh, <laughs> you know, so there were there were all these universes that I could tap into, uh, and then there were all these strange little moments, like like the fireflies were originally just supposed to be very pretty and you know like a little crown for Sarah and. Uh, and then they started talking in the voice of like a philosophy major I had dated in university. <laughs> <laughs> and Jared's reaction was basically mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so as I was writing my way in, um, it just expanded and expanded. And I realized in the very, very first draft that I had hit 400 pages and still hadn't gotten to the main antagonist. <laughs> 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 well, you know, it might be two books. Um, 
and then like when I was trying to get around uh, like I had a lot of flashback scenes to get them at and I was trying to solve like a flashback dump by interspersing it in the last third of the first draft. So it'd be present, present in Kitimat, no, present in Vancouver, flashback to Kitimat, present in Vancouver, flashback to Kitimat for about 10 chapters. <laughs> and none of my first readers could figure out what was going on because there were so many characters and so many timelines and there were flashbacks within the flashbacks within the flashbacks and then aside stories. So uh, my by then I had an editor and she was like, well, you know, you know, there's there's so many different elements. It, it's a very complex story. Maybe we can simplify the structure a little and move it into a more linear form. And that was actually a radical idea for me. <laughs> I was like, hmm linear <laughs> so when I moved like those those five little chapters to the beginning of the manuscript um they started expanding they started like like a sourdough starter like it was like nothing and then it became this like giant mother uh so, <laughs> so I realized that might be a book too <laughs> So the entire Kitimat section became Son of a Trickster, and where I started Trickster Thrift became the middle. And the third book, Return of the Trickster, um, you know, Georgina finally gets her, her stage presence. Um, she's off stage for most of the book, but, you know, in the last third, she's definitely there. Uh, so I have the greatest respect for writers that write series now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of detailing it's a lot of um considering like you know future books and like you know when you have to go back and explain exactly why this happened and you just threw it in there but now you know it's 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 jarring so there were and each of the characters is developing in a different way it's like yeah i have no idea how people do it with 10 books uh because i i it took a lot to do three books. <laughs> I think I'm going to do a couple of one-offs for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't easy. blame you. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems a lot easier now. <laughs> and yet, you know, I have to say that... <laughs> And I, I absolutely know, like I was reading it and thinking this looks effortless and I know it's not like I, as a writer, I know that it's not effortless, but it looks like it is. So, I mean, it's really wonderful to hear your process and, and what you went through. I mean, I knew it, I knew it wasn't effortless, but <laughs> it comes off that way. <sighs> I always tell, I tell my family, I say, okay, read this but read it really slowly because it took me a long time to write it <laughs> well, well i have a lot of writing friends and uh, some of them have like a more organized like writing style than me so they'll come out with a book every two years and they're like really disappointed that i haven't read all their books and it's like you know written six <laughs> <laughs> You've written 24. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> exactly. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, it's it's um yeah, the 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 you know, it was it was a very different process from writing a standalone book. And it, it was uh, it was a lot of fun to play in the world, and um, usually, like, I know a book is over when I don't think about it when I wake up, and I don't think about it mm. when I go to sleep, so uh, I had other storylines that I wanted, like, to go, to go forward, um, uh, so I thought there would be a fourth book, but, you know, I uh, my my muse has you know said very clearly that this is the end 
<laughs> Stop. <laughs> when, you, when when I stop being obsessed about something, then it's pretty well done for me. Like when I've yeah. stalled out, when I've stalled out in other stories, like it's it's just I've I've lost interest. Uh, um, you know, mm. my, I I'm being dazzled by something else. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was it was it was super like <laughs> it was a pretty griefy summer because uh, you know I realized that I wouldn't be spending a lot more time with these characters. So it was like there's always a like for me like there's always a little bit of a letdown when a book ends because it, mm-hmm. it has been such a journey. Uh, was the trilogy it had been 10 years of my life so wow uh yeah i know (laughs) (laughs) i meant that in a good way (laughs) i was was like oh so there was it was it really it really was like a breakup it was uh you know if you've been with someone for 10 years and you know you know it's just not working anymore um, but, you, but you saw, but you signed a lease. <laughs> oh boy! So you, so you have to be roommates for a bit before you can go your separate way. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best analogy I've ever heard. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness! And then um, there's, there's no like. You know, when you try and talk about it with your therapist, they're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's explore your feelings. <laughs> yeah, it was like, it's like, uh, um, yeah, no, so I've, I've, I just, you know, I really like my characters. I, I even mm-hmm. like the oak. I even like the ogress. I, I don't agree with some of the things she's done, but I understand her motivations. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think I think if the koi wolves had had a better shake in life, uh, they wouldn't be so goody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think one of the things I would love to, like, uh, I've had some people requesting more with the Sasquatch. <laughs> I, I loved at the end where you, um, I think it might be in the acknowledgements and you talked about, or the little bit at the end where you talked about your dad really wanted there to be a Sasquatch. <laughs> so, so here he is. <laughs> that was wonderful. This is my gratuitous Sasquatch scene. <laughs> <laughs> like, he worked. He was great. <laughs> well, uh, I had spent like a, a lot of time in Whistler. Um, I asked my niece and nephew like what they, you know, what was their heart's desire, and they wanted to ski, uh, snowboard, and I was like, ah, that makes no sense to me, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> So we went to Whistler for their spring break and they, they snowboarded and, um, you know, I have a terrible sense of direction. Uh, like my dad used to be a hunter and a trapper and a fisherman. Uh, and even, even at the worst of his Parkinson's, he always knew where we were. He was always flabbergasted that, you know, I wouldn't know which way was east and uh, which way was north. <laughs> 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 so all the time that we were in Whistler, like I, I kept getting us lost, and I had a GPS. I just didn't really, didn't really get what it was telling me to do. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to explore a lot of Whistler, and um, like I saw, like like we went by this house that looked like a mushroom, and um, that was originally what I wanted. Uh, my wild man of the woods, I wanted him to live there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I realized that might be a little too on the nose. So let's you know, put him in a, uh, you know, one that was like in a slightly posher part where there were more trees. Because I think he would be more interested. Like if you're a wild man of the woods, you would want to be in the woods. So 
he'd have a house that reflected that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as I was, uh, you know, going into the relationship between Anita, we get and Chuck. (laughs) 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 It was a lot of fun. They were the uh, Anita and we get really way the Liz and the Liz and Richard of their generation and like mm. whenever whenever we get would cheat on her, she would find one of his trickster cohorts and, you know, date him until you know, it drove we get nuts. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck would be like they would triangulate with Chuck a lot. So I really wanted to explore that in fiction. Um mm-hmm. But whenever I try to go there, it just, it stalls out. So it's like, okay, you know, we'll put that one, you know, uh, in another pot on the back burner. (laughs) 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 Sometime, sometime in the future, we'll have the fighty res couple. (laughs) (laughs) That, yeah. The, the characters are so great. Like they're just it and this this book is so populated. Um, there are just so many, you know, and that's Jared. <laughs> and Jared's just surrounded, right? Like this is his pack or whatever. It just works. Like it's just wonderful. There's no time as a reader, there's no time to breathe. Like it's just go, go, go. Which is terrific. I love it. Thank you. I'm used to like like large casts. Like my, I have like sixteen aunties and uncles on my mother's side, and oh, wow. only, yeah. only only thirteen on my dad's. Uh, so, oh, only. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you have their baby names, their nicknames, their their feast yeah. names, their joke names, their you know, uh, then the, then their actual names. Um, and then like you have like all their backstories and so I'm, I'm used to thinking about, you know, uh, casts as having, you know, like, like Russian novels there. <laughs> <laughs> Epic. Epic. <laughs> when I was writing Monkey Beach, it was super hard because, um, uh, you know, it was a very large cast for a, like a a novel, um, and I had you know I had a what I thought of as a small family. It was like you know two grandmothers, one grandfather, you know fourteen aunts, six uncles, you know forty <laughs> forty two cousins, the main character, <laughs> her friends, you know, uh, so, and they all had names. They had thick names. They had you know they they had like different names for each other and other characters had different names for them um and that was just what i grew up with so i'm used to holding a large cast in my head and Mm -hmm. you know people were putting stickers to try to follow things (laughs) so we had to keep like (laughs) like amalgamating and amalgamating and amalgamating to get the cast down to something that was manageable especially since it was my first novel and I didn't really have a handle on plot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there were the, it was. I think like the first draft was like eight hundred pages, and I hadn't really wow. I ha- I hadn't really focused on a main character yet. It was still kind of wandering. Uh, it was like <laughs> no. uh, like the German editor was like yeah like an 800 page mood poem. So like, so for, so for the book, like we had to cut it down to like about 500 pages to make it manageable. Um, wow. once, we, once we amalgamated the characters, once we like, um, you know, once I chose the tenses for the different timelines, uh, Mm-hmm. It, it started to take shape and um you know i knew where it was going i knew where it started but everything in between was like you know and you can tell it's a first novel because the first third is like so tight gets a little mushy <laughs> and that's rushed yeah. at the end. <laughs> <laughs> 
I read it now and go, oh my God. Okay. I'd like to edit that. I'd, li I'd like to do, I think you should be able to do like an edit of your own books, like every 10 years. <laughs> yeah. If, if you look at my, if you look at my reading copy, I have edited myself. And so when I read, <laughs> I'm reading the edit. Yeah. It's never finished. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just so yeah. much better. <laughs> yes, yes. So. And, and, you know, uh, well, the I've been, like, thinking about, like, uh, telling a story that requires multiple narrators. So I've been jokingly mm. calling it my trashy band council romance. And it <laughs> uh, <laughs> demands multiple narrators. <laughs> So, like, yeah, so I've been reading, like, so many books that just, like, you know, um, the, the, you know, they, they each deal with multiple narrators in different ways, and they use it for different purposes. And so, you know, I think, um, like, because most of my stuff is in first person or third person limited, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, I still have a lot of stories that I can tell, but it limits the scope of the book. So Return of the Trickster was when I started playing with multiple narrators. And it was a lot of fun. Like it was, it was uh, like getting the voice was particularly fun. Uh, like slipping into Maggie's voice, slipping into Anita's mm -hmm. voice, like, you know, and the way they talk at different times like uh like when you structured your book like when you structured probably ruby um did you know that it would be multiple voice i don't I, i'm gonna say no because i i probably didn't write like that like in terms mm. of structuring structuring to begin with but then uh yeah, it, it evolved, that evolved in. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say that those, in Return of the Trickster, where you bring in those other voices, I loved that. I thought that Aww. was fantastic. So if you're gonna work on another book with multiple narrators, I feel like it's gonna be terrific. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm just gonna love it. <laughs> well, but when I was reading, when I was reading your book, like I have a, a car crash scene, and then I was reading like your car crash scene. Mm -hmm. <laughs> going, yes, I, that's, that, that's a really great detail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm steal that. <laughs> I I feel like there's bits of of overlap too, like with the the drinking and the you know the, the sort of unorthodox characters and yeah. Uh, and the way like their relationships change and like you know mm. and as they as they flow through different parts of their life yeah yeah there are yeah yeah that's okay. good do we do you how do you feel about an audience question now oh i, I like we probably should get to that <laughs> okay so here here's a question it doesn't say who it's from, so I can't say that, but it says, what is your advice for beginner writers on creating characters who are very different from each other, but still exist in the same universe? From Vanessa V. Oh my goodness, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, it, it depends on what you want them to do together. Like, is this a rom-com? Is this a revenge tale? Is this, um, is this a, poignant character study uh you sh like i i start with characters so um like when i'm when i'm creating characters i usually go in there with uh like a, a general idea of who they are but as i'm writing my way into that universe uh they become very specific and they become specific through their words and actions um because you're it's always interesting when there's a dichotomy between what the characters are thinking and what they say and what they do um so like if you had a character that was cheating but you know completely believed in the sanctity of marriage but didn't see it like you know like 
how does that play out with his partner? How does that play out with his lover? How does that play out with people surrounding him? Um, so sometimes it it helps me to to write without the intention of showing it to anyone. Um, so mm -hmm. so that I can be completely honest with that character and give them a lot of space. So everything you write doesn't have to be published. Like there there are some things where you write like incredibly awkward things and um you know it, it's really good if you know more than what your character knows like if you understand mm -hmm. what's motivating them and the only way to do that is to really get to know them um so in the context of the story that you're writing um you know how is this very different person in their life like are they related are they friends um, was, was it an opposite to attract? Um, so, you know, when you're thinking, like, if you're thinking about, like, a story, for instance, with coworkers, <laughs> 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 like, they can communicate in very different ways, and they can both be good people, but their styles of communications can be completely different, and that's where a lot of their conflict can come from, and you can have people around them um, trying to mitigate or explain or just gossip about them. Um, if you have like characters who are both going after the same thing, but with with very different purposes and very different meanings, um, you know, usually your characters evolve by what they do. Uh, you know, when you're like when someone like like you know in our last election. <laughs> There are things that people say, <laughs> and then there are things that people do. So when you're creating characters, like the the unexplained conflict between those two positions can be very interesting, um, especially if you know if you have other characters examining it or questioning it. Um, so that's that's where a lot of the tension can come from, but. Uh, you know, what I really like with characters is how they play off each other. So when my first drafts, I tend to have the main character being the most sympathetic. And the story like is warped to serve their point of view. And that's not very fair to the other characters. So in other drafts, um, you know, I start to mitigate and, you know, try to see things from the other person's point of view. Because if it's, you know, if such and such a person is golden and they never do anything wrong and, you know, they always do what they say, you know, it, it gets, you know, it's, they're sympathetic, but a little boring mm -hmm. um, for me. <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> whereas if you can show like the the multitude that is within everybody in your character um you know they have some flaws they have some faults you know they're understandable given you know the backstory um and they come up against someone who was equally flawed and equally gifted and also has a backstory uh you know and they both want want the same thing and there's you know uh, just the way that the characters move around each other tells you so much about them. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a very long way of saying, you know, play with your characters. <laughs> <laughs> that's, every, yeah. every, once, every once in a while, tell the story from their anime's point of view. <laughs> 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 That's a great point. Uh, well, I'm getting a note here that we are basically out of time. So I want to thank you so much for this conversation and for writing this incredible series of books. Um, I can't wait for whatever comes next. And I am inviting David to come back and wrap things up for us. So Marcy, and thank you. and. Uh, Looking forward to whatever's next, Eden. 
uh, as, and we are as well. Thanks so much, Lisa, and thank you, Eden, for this wonderful conversation. It's been a joy to listen to you, and we're so <laughs> grateful that we could. Very well. <laughs> we're so grateful that you could both join us tonight. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problems. Okay, uh, and my res. Uh, and my, my res oh, go ahead. Oh, my res broadband kicked out. Uh <laughs> okay. Well, I was just saying, it's been such a joy to uh, to listen to your conversation. So thanks so much. Uh, we, we really appreciate you being here. And uh, thanks oh, to everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, and then thanks to everyone for tuning in from home. Uh, if you'd like to get your own copy of Return of the Trickster by Eden Robinson, or probably Ruby by Lisa Bird Wilson, please check out our official booksellers, Bakker Phoenix Books, and another story bookshop here in Toronto, uh, or our official ebook and audiobook sponsor, uh, Rakuten Kobo. There is one day left to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreets.ca slash 2021-virtual-festival contest. Oh, sorry. Slash 2021-festival-contest. It should be in the chat now. Uh, for your chance to win one of our three special prize packs, including a new Kobo e-reader. And uh, as a reminder, each day of the festival that you tune in, we announce one bonus entry code. Today's bonus entry code is Trickster. Please uh, stay with us on the Word on the Street YouTube channel. Coming up next, we have a conversation with Andre Alexis uh, and Jose Teodoro. On Ring, Andre Alexis's final novel in the Quincunx cycle that includes the Canada Reads favorite, 15 Dogs. And we also hope you'll join us back here tomorrow for the final day of our 2021 virtual festival. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street by making a donation or to see the full schedule, you can simply head to toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca uh, and uh, you'll find the schedule and the Donate Now button on the festival homepage. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great evening.